Hello, and welcome to the 126th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday, the 9th of July, 2020, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. Today, I'm delighted to speak with Greg Belvedere, the man behind the Rebel Base YouTube channel and regular contributor to current affairs. In a bit of a blast from the past for this pod, we take a deep dive into the collapse and peak oil scene and discuss Greg's video on the eco-reactionary John Michael Greer. If you like today's episode, perhaps you could consider becoming a patron. For only five bucks a month, you get two patron-only episodes every month, the regular episodes a few days early, and the right to vote on the next reading group series. Okay, let's go to the interview. Greg, I came across a tweet of yours last week. It was a blast from the past for me. It was a critique you made of the politics of a guy called John Michael Greer, who calls himself, I think, the... He used to have a blog called the Archdude Report. I think it's changed now. It's What is it called? Uh, it's Echo Sophia, because he was at one point the head of a large Druid organization, and then I think he stepped down from that. So uh, after about a year of holding on to that name, I think he changed it. Yeah, so that's it. That's his blog. And, and basically, you've been doing the hard work of reading some of these kind of I would consider them slightly, re- well, depends what we'll call them, but kind of reactionary green blogs. How did you get into this stuff? I think like a lot of people, I think in the in the aughts, you know, I was probably always been pretty far on the left, but I think that there weren't many things happening up until, I don't know, starting with Occupy maybe. Um, there really wasn't a lot in the news or, you know, you know, aside from the Iraq war protests when I was younger. So I, I got interested in it and I'd heard about peak oil. I was very interested in that. And I was also into the occult. I still am into the occult. And so a few people had recommended his blog to me and I started reading it and I was like a really avid reader. He is genuinely or was genuinely like, if you're interested in the occult, He's good at like cutting through some of the bullshit that is around the occult to make it harder for people to access. And he was good about talking about, you know, peak oil and problems with resource depletion and and whatnot. So that's how I got interested in him. And for a while, I thought he was really interesting, but it was always strange because he never quite could tell where he was politically. He did that thing where he tried to be like really even handed and like kind of criticize the left and right equally. And then around 2016, that started to change. He started to become more, first of all, he predicted that Trump would win before any of the primaries, which is kind of impressive considering it took a lot of people by surprise. But then he started to like actually go beyond predicting and say things that were like more favorable towards Trump. And that's when I think a lot of people who were like me and were maybe lefties or liberals who were on board kind of started to move away. And as time has gone on, he's kind of picked up more hard right audience you see it in the comment section. Some of the things you see sometimes and that he nods his head with actually are like pretty obviously like things from far right, you know, far right sites. And of course, there's this there's something that often flows from that type of understanding of like resource uh, scarcity, which is like, well, the resources are scarce. We need to you know, manage them and maintain them and stuff. And this is true, but if you don't do that conscientiously, it can take you to some really fucked up places. Yeah. So I never really, I read some bits of his now. I was very much aware of him. You know, when 2008 happened and the crisis happened and, you know, I used to consider myself very well read, you know, I used to read like the economist magazine and, you know, (laughs) I knew how the world worked. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, like then I was like, what the hell? And then I, I kind of like drifted onto like I found a few podcasts and a, and a few blogs and stuff. And like you're saying at that time, there was literally it was all libertarians. And then there was some peak oil managed to go through. And there was nearly nothing on the left a bar like Democracy Now or Chomsky or something. It was very, very marginal. 
So I went through the the same kind of stuff as you of like reading in about peak oil and going through. I, 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 like, I kind of, I, I still think peak oil is science. You know, I yeah. still think it is science. How, I don't know if the collapsitarianism associated with much of the peak oil stuff is scientific anymore. Whereby that, you know, they, they say, oh, well, you know, wind could never replace stuff or, you know, solar, that'll never work. You know, there is a lot of that kind of doomery part to it. But I went through a lot of, you know, people like who I've had on the show, I've had like people like Dmitry Orlov, for one in particular, ex-Russian guy who wrote a book on the collapse of the of the US. And like, it didn't take me too long to, to see like, not blow my own trumpet now or anything like, but like, I was very skeptical of a lot of the politics of the people you know, and I think that scene, like a lot of the people tended to, I think, to quite either dystopian, kind of right wing dystopian type politics. What do you what do you make of that? Like, so people like I wrote down a few names here today, like there is like Orlov, James Howard Kunstler. He's quite reactionary. Michael Rupert. He was mm. quite reactionary as well. So they were they were like three of the bigger ones. Now, 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 now John Michael Greer. What is it about that scene? You know, well, it's tough to say um, what it is exactly about the scene. For me, I think inherently there is a drive to preserve. And when there's a drive to preserve, I mean, I feel like that can be inherently reactionary. It inherently says like, no, we need to protect this thing that we have. And I mean, someone like Greer, especially, you know, he identifies as a Burkean and to some extent like okay fair enough I am I'm, I'm a lefty and I don't really uh hold with Burke but I get the impulse to say well and I feel like I've even heard Orlov say this before like has this worked before you know it hasn't okay well how many times have you tried it has it ever worked when you've tried it why not and I think that's a fair uh criteria to throw in there but they smuggle a lot of like very reactionary ideas in and with Greer was Burke not like somebody who's in favor of monarchy and against the bourgeois democracies yeah yeah exactly and bourgeois democracies all those revolutions worked everywhere is a bourgeois democracy now yeah so it's like as a Burkean it's not a very good argument against something new being born yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's it's always it always struck me as is really strange. And I don't know, I started to really see Greer very clearly last year when I went, read Corey Robbins book, The Reactionary Mind. And in that he kind of talks about just this very old reactionary technique of co-opting either leftist values or maybe just like leftist, you know, window dressing or whatever and reappropriating them to put out like right wing arguments. And I think Greer is fucking awesome at doing that. And the thing that he does, and I, I feel like the two things that really got me where I, 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 I think I was probably reading him for a long time thinking like, okay, I see myself as on the left. I don't actually see anybody on the right who is putting forth good arguments for me to debate. This guy, though, is putting forth some good stuff for me to like actually ponder. And so I, I, I looked at him like that. But then it got more to the point where like, no, this shit is really, really bad. And so w there were two things in particular that really got me. And the first one wasn't even on his blog. It was on like he has a dream with, which is like a it's like a half-ass social media. It's like not, I don't know. He said he didn't want to use a, a regular social media, but he, it's like a microblogging site. And he had a thing about Krampus and Christmas and how he was in favor of uh, corporal punishment for children and how that was one of the problems with children nowadays. Now, <laughs> I have two oh, kids. Alarm bells, alarm yeah, bells. I have two kids. And look, I don't want to judge people for how they raise their kids. I don't particularly agree with poor, corporal punishment, but I also don't want to like shame people who do it. I may, I maybe don't think it's as horrible in, a, in an overt way, but I think there is politically something really fucked up about the argument he made. And the argument that he made that really stood out for me was, and I, you hear it from people who are in favor of corporal punishment all the time. You hear like, 
oh, well, they never, you know, you should hit, if you're going to discipline your child physically, you shouldn't do it in anger, which I almost would approve of the anger more than the cold, like de <laughs> delting out of finite physical punishment that you are acclimating your child to, as you say, nope, dad, like, like it, it acclimates, I don't know, I just feel like it acclimates you to a very, you know, just like cold, like rigid, like bureaucratic, like type of punishment. So there's that. But then the other thing was, and he started talking about immigration and he does this, he does this really well if you're a reactionary. And so instead of point, you know, instead of addressing the fact that, you know, obviously immigration policies that restrict, you know, people coming into your country, you know, those are going to put, you know, immigrants in jail and send them back home to countries that might not be safe. Instead of talking about that, he puts this onto the liberals and, you know, the coastal elites who are getting all the benefits of immigration, but unlike working people aren't paying any of the costs. They get cheaper goods and services, but they don't have their wages diminished because they're not doing those jobs, which is true, but it's it's hiding the ball. It's like saying, you know, it's taking all, you know, it's like saying, no, we can push all these policies. We can push all these policies. And instead of focusing your attention on the fact that these policies are going to hurt very vulnerable people, no, you're focusing your, your attention on the fact that these policies that you're, you're promoting are going to hurt these well-off people who you hate and who thumb their nose at you because they're fancy people on the coasts or whatever. And that is like, was like when I read the reactionary mind last summer, like that was ex exactly what he talks about. Like trying to take that impulse, which is a real like working class, like understanding of the world and just kind of like twisting it and, and using the affectations of it without actually keeping any of the substance. You know, immigration is such a perfect policy for right wingers. It's because like every boss you like when I worked in in America one summer, I lived in New York for a summer and I, I was very shocked. Uh, I genuinely still to this day, I was very shocked. Like we're, a lot of times what you would see is like if it was a, a pizza shop delivery or something, they'd have like Mexican guys or South American guys who are you can guarantee they were illegal and like you can guarantee they were being paid shitty wages. And it was like, you know, it's such a brilliant Thing for the right because they can say look they're driving down your wages and stealing your jobs and th they're the very people who bring them in and play that card onto the working class you know it also strikes me as well like that you know any kind of an ethical kind of way of dealing with that would be as an international working class movement to say you know particularly as being an Irish person like we have got in Ireland, like we got a we got a, a culture of emigration. The economy does bad. The government just basically basically helps people out the door, you know. Like and you know that's like it's a it's a policy thing, you know. When there's a economic crisis in Ireland, they go, oh well, it was alleviated. Our unemployment is only nine percent. It would have been sixteen if everybody had stayed here. So isn't that great, you know? <laughs> and like like Irish people, like they leave in droves every like ten years when there's a economic crisis, like ever since the famine or probably prior to the famine and it's like nobody wants to leave their own country like all these guatemalan people or mexican people they don't want to leave their home yeah like the problem is their homes are fucked yeah well you know I'm, what i mean i'm from long island right i'm from long island new york long island new york has a huge population of you're gonna get this or uh, of el salvadorians yeah. You know, and I'm sure there's people who are complaining about immigration, but they supported all the policies that created the horrible conditions in El Salvador in the 80s, where they were, you know, murdering, uh, you know, indigenous, were murdering people and, you know, the murdering nuns and the bishop and, and everyone. And yeah, it's, it's, you can't have it both ways. Yeah. And, it, and, and certainly with respect to like, say, like the established Democratic Party is like, you know, they support all those policies. It's a, it's such a boon to the right, th those policies. But yeah, like you've been blocked. Have you, you've been blocked from his blog. Yes, I can't comment on his blog. I can't comment on his blog. He IP blocks people. I mean, <laughs> if, I, hardcore. I, if I wanted like, to, I could get away around it. And I can, I've, I've been thinking about like using my phone uh, or something, uh, you know, from, from not my IP address or something like that. But I don't know. Uh, 
I don't give a fuck. Um, what, but yeah, what did he, he block you for? Uh, you know what? The comments might not might have been. I I can't tell because I left a comment where we disagreed and it seemed fine. And then I, a few months later, when some of the the comments I think we'll be talking about that, that I talk about in my video, w- when those happened, that's when they weren't getting through. And I was like, okay, this is this is strange. So talk about these comments. What are these comments here? Yeah. The so it's kind of amazing because, and this is very similar. It brings to mind some of the debates that are going on right now about right-wing populism in the kind of left media circles. And, you know, I like, I mean, I kind of agree with my sometimes editor, Nathan Robinson, that a lot of this right-wing populism stuff is, is bullshit. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, they, they might use the rhetoric, but when things actually get down to it, they're not going to do any of the things they say um, any more than Donald Trump has. But what was really interesting was he had had, he'd had a blog, he had a few blogs where he talked about left-wing extremism and how left-wing extremism has gotten so out of hand in this country. And it really puts off any type of anyone who's in the center or isn't radical from left-wing ideas. They're just too over the top, which is absurd on a lot of reasons. I mean, it's absurd mostly because, and the, and I think the thing he used to compare the things that he put side by side were not equivalent. And so like he used like this picture of like, Antifa burning a flag, which he claimed came from the mainstream news media. But when I looked and did a reverse Google search, every single site it appeared on was like, except for like the local paper that it appeared in first was a far right site. Some of them had like titles like, like Jew world order and like, 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 like real, like over the top shit, you know? (laughs) And so, and so like, here he is saying like, this is what the American people see. And like, no, the American people don't see that if they're not looking at far right sites. Now, maybe some more of them are because the mainstream media in this country does kind of suck, but it's kind of disingenuous. And so he had that picture up against like, uh, the Donald subreddit where there was like a picture of like some hotties for Trump. And it was like women with large breasts holding up, you know, sign that said we're for Trump or whatever. And, it, and, and he tried to compare these two things as if they were like equivalent examples of like far left and far right. When like, actually like the far right in this country has a body count and it completely it completely dwarfs any type of violence that we see from the left. And like, so I think, I think this is when he stopped letting my comments go through. So I was like, well, do you not see this or are you like obfuscating on purpose? Because this is clearly not, you know, these things are clearly not equivalent and you're amplifying one and diminishing another and and this, I think this one, these blogs, there's two that I commented on in the video, but one of them came about like after there was that shooting in El Paso where a guy cited ecofascism as a motivator. And he, this and Greer kind of was like, oh, you're going to hear about ecofascism. Why is everyone talking about ecofascism? What they just want to discredit anybody who talks about resource depletion. That's all they're trying to do. And it's like, no people are talking about eco-fascism because there's been a bunch of people killed lately because of it. Like, you know, you're, you've gone past the point where I can believe that you don't know this, you know, or that like, it's obviously like where your loyalties are now. In the video, you were saying like, you don't know if he's an eco-reactionary or an eco-fascist. What does his take being on the Black Lives Matters movement then? Oh, yeah. I mean, he hasn't come out with a blog explicitly about Black Lives Matter, but he has had some comments and he has like a once a month, he has an open blog where people comment. And some of the things that people say on there are just, again, amazing. Just wild, crazy YouTube comment. Yeah. Well, uh, 4chan. You know, more crypto, I would say. And those are like kind of more interesting because they're more clueless in a way. They're not just, 
you know, as, as self-aware, I guess. And so like the one in particular was this guy like quoting all these stats about like, oh, black people aren't actually targeted that much. And anyone who thinks that is not looked at the numbers. And then he proceeds to cite all these different references. And one of them was like, the first one was, was Colette, which is uh, okay. Borderline. Yeah. Best. But then, but then he's, he, he, I forget the name of the site, but it was one that like was obviously white supremacist because he, and he linked to a bunch of articles from it. And this one was obviously white supremacist because the fir- the author of the first article that he listed from the site was Jared Taylor, like well-known white supremacist. And Greer's response to this is like, yeah, I pretty much agree with those, with those statistics and, and your take there. And, and like, and so he's bad, but then you see the people who congregate around him and they're like, you know, he really has no problem playing to that crowd. He has no problem playing to that crowd. And I actually, um, I shared one of my, I shared the John Michael Greer video to uh, like the collapse subreddit. And I might've done it more than once, but I think on both, I think on both occasions, I had people say, no, he's not an eco-fascist. I'm tired of people calling Greer and me an eco-fascist. He's like, I just think that we need to close our borders and let everyone outside them die off. I'm tired of being called an eco-fascist. <laughs> it's, it's like amazing. Like I can't, do you hear yourself? Like there, it's really, it's, it's really something else. There's a lot in the collapse kind of people culture that Orlov and people like him or James Howard Kunstler and, and they, they like really, really are against anybody taking action because the system is too big to change or we, it's all hopeless anyway. Why don't we all just like write blogs and make a living off blogs? Yeah. And I, I, I've started to th- I've started to think that Greer and, and these guys are like they get off on being contrarian, not not necessarily just for the fact like the you know the pleasure of being contrarian, but they they like being contrarian. They like the fact that that they're disagreed with, and they take it as like a point of pride. Which okay, fair enough. Maybe they think they're right. They probably think they're right, but it's very very strange that to degree which like they can't see how much they feed off that the fact that they aren't offering anything like positive i I don't know like i i spent like some time like trying to and i still do like you know like i i I have i belong to a community spot sponsored agriculture program i like try and be conscientious about not driving too much i try not to like be like too profligate a consumer but like honestly at the end of the day that's bullshit because uh, most of your consumption is is part of the system you're in that you can't change and you doing things on the margin aren't going to do anything they might prepare you if you know maybe we're all going to have to do with less in the future and you get used to it and you know and some of them are nicer like my tomatoes i get at my farm share are better than store-bought tomatoes so i don't eat fresh tomatoes most of the year because they're just kind of they're kind of meh so like i mean those things are nice and fine and good but like to think that that's all you can do you know and like to not look for any type of collective ways of solving these problems or to like not think that maybe this massive infrastructure that we have in front of us we shouldn't just say well it's gonna we should we should you know like they think we should say oh well it's gonna crumble or whatever let's just kind of do our thing on the margins and it's like well how about actually taking control of some of that infrastructure and making it scaling it down and to a level where we can all use it and that's just kind of like out of the question for them like it's just and it's interesting because part of me thinks that the like the hardcore collapse people might be right like yeah they might be right we might be completely fucked you know i don't know and this is a big problem for me like there's a big epistemological problem cuz like i don't know uh, i mean you talk to you talk to hall and i'm you're probably familiar with the prieto the the book that him and uh prieto put out i know he was talking to you about it in that episode they did a report together and it, it's on energy skeptic and it's just about like 
you're building a solar array in the desert. You need to have someone come clean those panels off. And there's all these, you know, there's all these costs that accumulate. And maybe we're not going to be able to get as much energy out of those things as we thought. And now I don't know. I'm not an engineer. I don't have the correct competencies. And, you know, nobody has all of them. You know, nobody knows the science and the economic and the economics and this. Uh, you know, nobody has all those pieces. So it is kind of an open question if we're going to collapse or not. But there's something so like just dark about this. Nope, that's it. We're fucked. You're just going to the best we can do is, you know, be prepared for the collapse. And that's it. Like uh, like Dmitry Orlov says, you know, America is just going to be exactly the same as what happened in the USSR. But like I've done like quite a lot of research and reading on the USSR thing. Like there's one thing that like came out from an interview I heard with a guy and he was saying he was like basically in the archives in like Moscow reading like the economic problems that the planners were having and one one of the things was that was happening at the time was that there was i think there was three different rubles at the time there's like an external ruble hmm. which i think was pegged to gold there was an internal ruble that you would buy stuff with your wages and then there was a third ruble which was basically the rubles that different firms used for buying and selling between different like companies and very often what would happen is like one company being being run really badly and the central government would just go okay we're just going to slash all their debts you know just we'll just give them some more rubles just on a computer or whatever and we'll say okay you know your debts are gone but at, the, at one point they allowed the managers to take out loans of these type of rubles and actually use them in the real world outside of inter-firm trade hmm. and so they could buy they, for whether it was like intended or not they were able to basically spend extra rubles out to, into the normal consumer market and there was basically and a lot of these guys who were running these firms were like kind of bureaucratic guys or firm managers going god we could make a killing here boys you know and it was in their interest they just basically got huge amounts of of money together and the central government were trying these reforms and this thing started going and no one would reform it because everybody was in the know was making loads and loads of money and bang you get hyperinflation the whole thing collapses and you have the us on the outside going let's go in here and try and fuck it up like so if, if it was all about peak oil in russia how come their economy has recovered to a size now that's bigger than it was in 1990 if it was purely a peak oil phenomenon so like the fact that like these other countries have come back it makes me very skeptical of like this idea that things are all screwed i know like the stuff you're talking about this like what's your what's what do they call it your eroei yeah, is it yeah. The, your energy returned on energy invested it's like you know that stuff is an open question like you know from what i could make out you know i'm no expert or anything in it so like the fact that you would be so goddamn sure that like okay that's it lads five billion of us have to die yeah yeah like it's how, like what yeah. is that about that says something more psychological or 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 reaction or just i think just plain reactionary like i was kind of after a couple of years you know i was i don't know where did you actually hear these guys i think i got i came to them through maybe max kaiser show or something weird like that i want to say actually from from Greer's blog. I mean, from Greer's blog and some of the other guys, like I never followed. But how'd you find it? How did you find this? Just for the occult stuff, is it? Yeah, I just, for, I think, well, you know, my, my rule of thumb is when more than one person recommends something, I check it out. And so I had read this a really great occult book, by the way, for anyone who's interested in the occult is On Becoming an Alchemist by Catherine McCoon. And I had corresponded with her about something else. And about something that I was writing at the time that didn't end up going anywhere, but it was about technology. And she was like, Oh, you should read John Michael Greer because he's very interesting about technology. And I think I had maybe heard about him somewhere else. Cause I may maybe like in relation to like Mike Rupert, cause I had followed him maybe. And then, I don't know, and then I started like reading his blog and I would check out him, check him out if he was on a podcast and he definitely different type of thinker and like good for a lot of cult stuff. But yeah, these it, it it is very it is very funny. So like, there's this idea in the occult, like levity and gravity. You know, higher spirits, angels, and stuff they bring you up, but it's very detached from the ground. And then you know, like darker spirits, they pull you down to the ground. And you know, 
to be fair, a lot of aspects on, in our culture are not attached to the ground. So I think that's probably why I was seeking out like stuff like Greer or something, you know, like you, you, that definitely there's something very grounding, but at the same time, like, I think he, it, without a countervailing force, you just get pulled down until like everything is shit. Everything is dark. I was just reading my son, the sixth book in the Chronicles of Narnia, the silver chair. And there's a scene where there's a character and they're, they're trapped underground and there's a witch and she's trying to convince them that no, there's no surface. And the, the Aslan is a myth. He never existed. And that's just a memory. And this is a silly idea. And, and, you know, they're, they're, she's, putting them under the spell with this mist and all this stuff. And at one point, you know, they're fi- trying to fight it. And at one point, the one character says, you know, even if all that surface is bullshit, I still like it better than <laughs> this fucking thing you're telling me down here where we're all stuck in the ground. And I think I, I think that is right. I think that is the right impulse. <laughs> is that like, you know what? Yeah, you know what, John Michael Greer? Maybe we are all fucked. But like, I like it a lot better than, and this can connect to like kind of where his thought process takes you and what I kind of try and do that video is like, if you're always like so grounded, you are going to drill yourself down into the ground. You are going to support any type of like racist militarized border in the name of like, you know, defending uh, you know, who knows what he's actually th- th- thinks of it, but like, you know, in the name of supposedly defending American workers or whatever it is. Whereas like, you know, as I pointed out in that video, like at the time that that came out, like there was GM, I think it was GM workers or whatever, auto workers striking in the U S and Mexico. And I mean, that's what you need. You don't need like people saying, no, don't, don't come here. Or we need more militarized borders. Cause once you say yes to that, you're basically saying, yeah, I think that maybe is why the corporal punishment thing stuck with me because it's that same mentality. And like, I don't know, like I I know my own mentality and I know kids like you beat me. I'm just coming back. (laughs) Yeah. And like, especially with the thing where you should, you know, you should only hit your child, not out of anger, but like, Like anybody who has a child, like there's been times when my kid is so stubborn. I mean, better hope he's not listening. He's been so stubborn. Like, and he would drive, if you were tired, something drive you mad. And you would go, oh my God, you'd be clenching your fist. You know, you'd be saying to yourself, I'm so close. I'm so close. And you don't do it. I can't imagine what it would mean about your personality to say, I'll take that now and I'll wait an hour later and then I'll do it when I'm right. Yeah, like exactly. that is, that's a very deep level of thought. Exactly. Like, look, I don't condone it, but like, I can understand the people who get angry and hit their kid. I can understand that. I can't understand the people who are like, I'm going to do this completely like calm. And (laughs) no, if you're calm and shit, you should be able to think of a more productive way to discipline your child. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You should lose your child's license. That's what I think. Especially you were saying earlier that he was like saying about the, the left, you know, that they're complaining about you know the things they're putting forward are just too kind of far to the left you know for ordinary people like it's pretty wild coming from a guy who's like a druid and a pagan and a collapsitarian yeah like he's literally doing things i would say equivalently or more to the like i would say definitely more nearly off the scale than antifa yeah yeah definitely and i think that's one of the things that's that's just so frustrating about him is that he does he does he's very good at like hiding the ball and making out policies which are actually increasingly popular seem like they're you know off the scale and like he'll he'll does like a lot of like not tone policing but like kind of policing and being like, well, that's not practical, blah, blah, blah. But, and I think the thing, like one of the last comments I made to him that actually went through was like, well, all right, you've been talking about this stuff for like the last decade. And do you actually think it's going to stop global warming or like, or, you know, do you actually think it's going to make a dent or like, or are you just doing it like, like, why, what do you actually think is going to come from all these, a- these actions? And he kind of dodged it, you know? And, and it's like, what do you, like, what, like, don't you realize this is a, is a really hard sell for most people and that 
it's only going to like, it's only a matter of personal consumption that isn't going to change the system. Like, don't you get that? Like, where are you going with this? Where do you think this can go other than like maybe being prepared in, you know, once the rubble starts bouncing and he really didn't have anything directly for that. He just was kind of like, well, yeah, it is kind of optics. That's part of it. But it's about, oh, it's about mimesis. It's about mimesis. One person sees, you know, it working and then the da da and another piece of persons. And then eventually it's like, okay, that's kind of, I don't know. I feel like that's kind of a cop out because if that were the case, like, do you think, I, you know, like, which I don't know, kind of circles back my, to my initial question, which is like, do you think that mimesis is going to happen quickly enough for this to actually change anything and mm, but it's a yeah. it's a dumb point because like you can make the same point about being like a go- goddamn communist in america right now it's mimesis oh yeah well hopefully we'll just get it you know what i mean it's like you, you yeah, can't we'll, not use it on one on one politics and then use it on your own uh, yeah we'll start we'll start the chaz we'll we'll we'll, people, <laughs> we'll see what a, how great it is and then eventually you know it's it's gonna it's gonna spread and it's gonna spread I mean, my my pet idea, I don't know if you've seen me tweeting about it, is is occupying Trump's golf courses. I always thought that was a great idea. I've thought it before Trump became president, the <laughs> golf courses should get occupied. Um, they just take up so much like good like real estate in the US where we really don't have the climate for it. You're in Scotland. OK, it's a different story, maybe. But uh, <laughs> well, I think, yeah, no, you, what you want to do is you want to actually set your you set all your tents and everything up on the greens, though. Because yeah. if you screw the greens up, you know that's uh, that's what they, that's what some gangsters did in Dublin in the nineties. There was a golf course where all the the cops played golf, and they went and they they dug up all the greens. Yeah, like, dude, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Dig up the greens, dig some dig some garden beds, some <laughs> some latrines because you're gonna need them. And think about that. Think about people shitting on Trump's golf courses. Yeah, I think I think you'd even get some liberals in there for that one. You like, probably would, you know, maybe some like, trenches, get some trenches in there yeah. as well for when the cops come, yeah. get this, the spikes with, you know, so they take the horses out, you know, like the Scots did against the England and, yeah. and Culloden or something. I don't know what the hell it is. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, that that's my, that's kind of my feeling on that. But yeah, it's, it's funny. And like, I don't know, his Greer is, um, he's basically, uh, is he, is he a, a, like a druid boomer? That's what we have. He's a yeah, he's a druid boomer. He's a late boomer. Yeah, and he's also really gotten into like, you know, these SJWs are out of control type thing, which I thought was like really stupid the first time I heard it. I started making my videos about Jordan Peterson when I started my YouTube channel. So, I don't know, just that sort of thing is overly woke people are annoying. Yeah. Great. That's about as far as I think you can take that one. He's really run with that a lot. Did I hear you correctly say somewhere in the, in one of your videos that you interviewed him? I did. What did you interview him for? I, I you know I just just wanted to talk to him. I haven't done many interviews. I've interviewed like him, Doug Lane, Michael Brooks, Light of Gold from Current Affairs, and I haven't interviewed that many people. So you said in you said I think in the video that when you interviewed him, he brought up the Black Book of Communism. Yeah, like that's, I, that's kind of staggering. Yeah, and I kind of didn't know how to resp- like. I it caught me off guard. It caught me totally off guard. Because look, I realize he's like on the you know more of. I've always realized he's more on the right end of the spectrum, but I didn't actually expect him to come with that one. That to me is kind of like, like there's so many good arguments against. I I, I was just kind of like dumbfounded, and I didn't want to get into like an argument about fucking how many people died in China and how many, whether it was famine or whether it was, you know, you know, all those, you know, you know, you know, you know, it. yeah. Um, so like, I just didn't want to get into that whole thing, but I was like, how do you like, how do you really come at that and not, you know, see it on the other end. And then, you know, then, you know, talk about like some of the, the politics that he, that he, you know, uh, <laughs> that he like puts forward. It's, it's kind of amazing. I mean, ditto for like his thoughts on like social democracy and what, what does he think about social democracy? Well, I mean, it, he kind of points to Nordic countries as having these problems. And but I mean, the specific thing that he linked to that I'm thinking of 
was by Somebody John, Booth. John Booth's. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, well, they have high depression there. And and it's like, yeah, they live in, uh, <laughs> they live yeah, in places circle. where there's not a lot of sunlight. Of course they have depression. <laughs> like, no shit. Like, what? <laughs> it, it's just like these things, like, it, I, and they're like bad arguments. Like, and I, I think that's what bothers me the most about this is that like he used to, I used to go to him for like right wing arguments that I could like cut my teeth against working, you know, like, like arguing against. And now I'm just like, dude, come on. Like it's, 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 it's really amazing. I, I fall down on the line that he was always kind of a reactionary, to be honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is hit I- it better. He just hit it better. Yeah, and I think the Trump moment in America allowed people to think, oh, I can say more stuff than I used to think I could say and be acceptable in in society. I think he's one of them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I see it. I see it in his commenters. His commenters are like his commenters have changed. Like his commenters have gone from being like, you know, little, you know, diverse you know some hippie-ish lefties or liberals and then like you know righties but like you know green kind of righties you know Uh, but like now he's got he's got straight like he's got people with pepe avatars in his in his in his comments (laughs) you know and he's got he's got people sharing stuff from jared taylor and him like giving it the thumbs up and you know he so it's 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 definitely become more out in the open and it, it's surprising, actually, because after I made this video, a few people got in touch with me or commented who were like pretty so, very solid lefties. One of them is a potential Bernie Sanders delegate in New York. And they were like, wow, I, this is good to see that someone else thinks this because I used to follow this guy, too, but haven't in a few years. Like, <laughs> It'd be interesting to know if he got kicked out of the, the his job as the chief druid for politics, wouldn't it? I wonder if that would be interesting. I don't think so. I think he, I think he kind of just was like done with it or had, you know, had done his, had done his time. There's another, there's a guy who is an anarchist. He's a druid and he's kind of had some interactions with him. Uh, Reed Wildmuth, Gods and Radicals, I think is his uh, blog and internet publication. And so he's had some inter- interactions with him. It's interesting because there's, I mean, you know, you dig into any subculture and there's all like, you see basically the same types of cultural and political like squabbles that you see everywhere else, you know? Is there anybody, is there anybody else that you've been kind of following in the kind of that eco scene that has gone the way of John Michael Greer? I, you know what? I don't think so. I haven't followed Consular. I know he's pretty turfy, although I, I, I don't think he's a feminist. So turfy might not be the. Uh, he's the a homophobe word. as well. He's definitely yeah. homophobic. Yeah. You know? And I think racist, to be plainly honest with you. Yeah, I haven't followed him enough to to really get a read. Orlov is pretty weird. I never got too deep into Orlov. Who are some of the other people in that scene? Chris Martinson. Yes, he strikes me as just like a con man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it used to be it used to be in finance, so yeah. You know what I mean? Like, who are some of the other people? I'm um, trying to. There's one I'm thinking of. It's Richard Heinberg. He's good, I would think. Yeah, no, he's good. He's good. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's good. They got him on tape in that Planet of the Humans movie talking about overpopulation, which is unfortunate. unfortunate. It's one of those things where like. It, 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 there's a way to talk about those issues and there's a way not to talk about them. And it's hard. Cause like, yeah, we do have a resource problem and they're part of that is that there's lots of people, but oh, I mean, I, even if I think that I don't want to say it because like, it, cause so many people who say that the next step is, well, we need to do this, this and this, and these things are all fucking scary. Or, which is interesting, actually. Again, going back to Greer, the thing that is interesting, he had a blog a few years ago about overpopulation where he basically said it wasn't a problem. I don't think it's a problem either. Like, I, you know, yeah. it's a consumption thing yeah. than, a, prob- than a, a population thing. Well, but even in terms of like the actual population, he was just like, oh, the population will just settle itself out. Like, like, like we don't, like we don't have any control over that. If we, if we overshoot, we're just gonna, you know, you'll go to a few more funerals every year and a 
few less uh, christenings every year, and that'll be it. And we'll we'll poison the water like an algae bloom. Yeah, yeah. So I don't I don't know. I think that's in fairness to Richard Heinberg, like he's the one. I, like there's a couple I've written down that I I think I haven't. There was the automatic Earth blog I used to kind of follow. Uh, Nicole Foss. There was another one who was like they're kind of more. I would think people who are like Green Party voters as opposed yeah. to kind of just pure out and out collapsitarians. But like it's pretty, I would say it's a pretty, I wouldn't say hegemonic, but it's a very common thing in green circles overpopulation. I think that, would you think that's a majority of greens or is it, I don't know if it's a majority, but it's definitely a, a sizable chunk of green people think that yeah, I mean, I think it's, I, I think it's quite, I mean, I think it's quite a lot of people think that. I mean, I, it's not, if I, like, for example, in my videos, like, I don't, like, in my video on, like, eco-socialism, I don't even think I say the word. I might be wrong, but I don't even think I say the word. I talk about, I talk about consumption and systems of consumption, because, like, you know, I have many people have pointed out, like, they always seem to talk about overpopulation in, you know, Africa, yeah, Africa. in developing countries, those countries where there's the brown people, that's where we've seen very, very engaged in dealing with overpopulation. And like, to some extent, like, you know, because, you know, because which is silly, because we consume way more, you know, I, I forgot what the exact numbers are, but someone in the, you know, someone in, in a developed country consumes way more than someone in, in an under in a less developed country. It's just, it's ridiculous, the, the amount like a, a factor of 10 kind of is like yeah at least just probably. by gdp yeah yeah at least so you know so like saying like again it's it's one of those i want to police those people over there and well don't really worry about what i'm doing um i'm living in in the uk at the moment right and you know compared to ireland like ireland and england they're pretty much the same size england has got 10 times the population of ireland and it's like when I'm here, I do feel it like there's too many goddamn people. But you yeah. never hear about overpopulation with respect to like England, Holland, Japan, places that are really are overpopulated. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're incredibly densely populated. There is no green space. You know, there is no wildness like there is in America or Africa and places like that. So, you know, how it's couched, there's never a policy in a first world country for depopulation there's never a one child policy like in the west or anything like that it's it's weird because like there is this thing and i think there was an economist i saw do a ted talk on this like a decade or so ago i think it was hans rosling you know? yeah the swedish guy is it that swallows yeah. the sword yeah and he's just basically like look you know as countries get more developed people have less kids and so you have this weird thing where like consumption I, goes up yeah, consumption, consumption goes up. So That's it's like, yeah. uh, how do you, uh, what do you even do about that? Like, wh you know, like culturally, um, it's probably advantageous for people in developing countries to have more than one child. And then it's advent. So like, I, you got to talk consumption. Like, that's it. Like, you can't, like, yeah, there should be voluntary, voluntary <laughs> birth control. But like, beyond that, what else, what are you going to do? Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I could, we could, we could hatch some evil plans. Let me see. Is there anything else we haven't hit on here now? Oh, you know, I guess the other thing that he does a lot is he will tend to lump the left and like mainstream Democrats in together a lot, which is which is funny. You know, <laughs> it, it it's kind of like. I don't know. It's just, it's just very funny. It's like when I have like, I, I know some people who are more conservative and they'll, they'll talk about, Oh, I hate all these lefties. They all think the same thing. I'm like, dude, <laughs> like, I'm like, I, I, I kind of hang out in that media world and Holy shit. Do you have any idea that the, the stupid things these people squabble over? I'm like, I got to watch what I say every week. So I like stay on like, so I stay diplomatic towards everyone, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd be dead. <laughs> I wouldn't be able for that. I'm lucky I have my own podcast. It wouldn't last five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, you know, I think in people's biases like that, you see their true nature. I, I don't think it's reasonable for an intellectual like John Michael Greer. Cause that's, let's be plain. He is an intellectual. He's, he's a smart, he's, he's a really a smart, smart 
He's, he's a, smart a really guy. smart guy, and he's read hundreds and thousands of books, and he's systematized them well to towards his ends. It's just not a feasible thing that these biases are about a lack of learning. I think that you know it it exposes what is what he is, and you know Jordan Peterson plays that game as well, where he he always has arguments that basically misinterpret left and give cover to the right just look at who people's fans are you get a good idea of what they are like i it's not credible that say i you know i'm a communist that i could make all these arguments that say my arguments all tended to the right and my common section were all like racist right wingers it's not credible that i i don't know what i'm doing you know these are smart people i think they know i think they know exactly what they're doing yeah, oh, they know, I think he knows exactly what he's doing, and I, I, I think you can hear it in that in his blog where he talks about, well, they're going to start calling you fascist soon because you're talking about resource depletion and uh, closed borders, you know, and it, it, he's like prepping people, you know, it's it, in the same way that like a Stefan Molyneux or you know, they're they're kind of like prepping people for the pushback they're going to get. And in the way like a cult leader does, it's like, well, they, they up, oh, just like you said, they called me a fascist. Yep. I'm tired of this. These people are so intolerant, so intolerant. Now let me explain to you why <laughs> these people should <laughs> really deserve to fucking die. Like yeah. too bad for them. They weren't born in America. They didn't learn their lessons. Yeah. I warned them to leave. It's your fault. I'm going to have to shoot you and your child. Yeah. Yeah. Or like, you know, I can't even, I was trying to think of something more he had said about the BLM protests, but it was more just, he was actually kind of, oh, that was the thing he was talking about with the BLM protest. And this is another like right-wing calling card. He was talking about how there were protests that were being funded by foreign governments as if like you needed to fund these <laughs> As if like, yeah, that, that was the thing. It was stopping people from going out in the street. It wasn't the fact that, you know, they didn't have the time that which everyone has now because of the coronavirus or the excuse for getting out that that protesting gives them when, you know, you're not supposed to be going out. Like it wasn't that it was it's this foreign money that's coming in or just these weird like framings of things, you know, or he getting really bent out of shape about statues, which I, yeah, it's symbolic. I really don't care, but I'm also not going to, you know, you know, like uh, it's symbolic. I don't think it's that big a deal. If a statue gets torn down, it's not going to make a difference, but I'm also not going to get like, oh, people aren't going to learn history now because there's not a statue. Like, what? It's like, that's why there's not like loads of statues of m marks all over the place or like, you know, because yeah. we want to teach them about history. You know, well, what I always wonder about is, then is like, are there any statues of Hitler and Himmler and Rommel even in Germany? Like they're definitely not, but like maybe there is one now or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I was just thinking like, why? Cause it's like the same argument. Like, why would you do that? Like they're to, they're to commemorate or put forth certain types of values. And most of those statues came up as a reaction to reconstruction and civil rights. Like they didn't come about because like as some sort of heritage, which by the way, only lasted a couple of years. <laughs> in Dublin in, I think 1966 or something, there was still in Ireland, there's still some like statues to like British generals and stuff. Not many, but one of them, the IRA blew up uh, Nelson's column. I, I think it was Nelson's in on the main street of Collins Street in 66. They basically put it, I think he just went flying through the air or something like that. <laughs> you know. And like there, nobody in Ireland went, you know, like the IRA was this, at that time was essentially like they were banned. They were very much trying to tamp down on the IRA. But nobody in Ireland goes, you know, what? we must rebuild that Nelson's column <laughs> to learn, teach us about our subjugation, you know. It's not. It's, I've never ever heard that ever being put forward. It's completely ridiculous. And to see somebody who used to be like a good, give me some good conservative arguments to argue against, and then and now it's just, it's lazy. I don't know. It's lazy. <laughs> Thank you.
On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Thank you.